Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's 2.30. Um, welcome back from your lunch break, and welcome to the TB in prison, Prisons session um, at AIDS 2018. I'd like to start with introducing myself. My name is Sabine Hermans. I'm an infectious diseases physician based here at the Amsterdam Institute for Global Health and Development and the Amsterdam UMC Hospital. Um, and I will be co-chairing the session with Robin Wood. Hi and welcome. Um, I'm Robin Wood. I'm from uh, University of Cape Town in South Africa and um, uh, an ID physician and researcher down there. So um, just a few words about the format today. We've actually got four speakers, so we've got a little bit of extra time for questions. And we'd like to take questions after each presentation. Uh, if you can identify yourself and your institution and uh, keep the questions um, fairly succinct, we're very grateful for that. Um, I think this is promising to be a very interesting session. And we'd like to kick off with um, the first talk uh, from Jason Andrews, who's um, assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Geographical Medicine at Stanford University. He's a friend and colleague over many years, and uh, he will be talking about TB transmission in prisons and spillover into communities. Why addressing TB epidemics in prisons should be a public health priority. Thank you, Jason. Thank you Robin. Good afternoon. I'm delighted for the opportunity to speak with you here this afternoon about work um, that we've been doing in TB in prisons and looking at um, transmission in prisons as well as spillover into the general population. So just wanted to start with an overview. Um, globally, TB incidence in prisons is 33 times that of the general population, a finding that has been consistently seen throughout the world. And a number of factors have been cited um, in this disparity, including crowding, poor access to care, malnutrition, drug abuse, tobacco use, um, HIV, and other causes. Against this backdrop, we've seen a growth in the global incarcerated population, um, such that by 2015, there are more than 10 million individuals who are incarcerated worldwide. Three quarters of the incarcerated population are in the Americas and Asia, with fully 20% um, of the incarcerated population occurring in, in my country and the United States. Um, and unfortunately, we see this continued growth. And this growth has been highly uneven. So the largest growth um, globally in incarcerated populations has been in Latin America um, and Central America, with over 100% growth over the course of, eight, of 16 years. And much of this growth has been driven um, by Brazil, and that's going to be um, the focus of my talk and where we do a lot of our work. So Brazil now has the third largest incarcerated population in the world after the United States and China with 676,000 prisoners. And this population has grown more than 275% between 2000 and 2016. So a really staggering rate of increase um, in incarceration that has occurred. And at the same time, um, when we look here, the black line is showing TB incidents across Brazil, so TB notifications across Brazil in absolute numbers. And what we've seen is that there's been essentially a flat line of TB incidents uh, in Brazil, no decline, very little progress towards the sustainable development goals. And when we sort of look under the cover at this, what we're actually seeing is that decreases in TB that are occurring in the general population are being offset um, by a growth in TB cases that are occurring among prisoners. And it's even more staggering whenever we look at certain age groups. So here on the horizontal axis is age group, and on the vertical axis is the percent of TB cases that are notified among inmates. And what we see is that among 20 to 30-year-old men, over a quarter of all TB cases in the country occur in prison inmates. And when we look geographically, it's further concentrated still. So this is a map of Brazil, and in the, in the sort of left-hand side, the western side, we see its border states where there are very high rates of incarceration, um, fueled by cross-border drug, drug trade and incarceration. And there are many states in which half of all TB cases in young men are occurring uh, in prisons. And this is not unique to Brazil. It's also not new. Um, so this is a um, newspaper clipping from the New York Times in 1903, which is reflecting upon this problem. And I just will read some of the highlights here. It's the, the article is called 
hard labor and tuberculosis. And it says, to sentence a prisoner to hard labor and tuberculosis would shock the moral sense of the community. And goes on to note that 90 to 100 TB patients are being discharged from the sanatoria, from the, from the prison each year with expiry of sentence um, without any precautions against their agency in spreading the infection wherever they go. Um, if prisoners, it concludes, if prisoners are not properly the objects of sympathy, um, perhaps the people outside the prisons may be so considered. So just sort of a staggering moral condemnation of TB over 100 years ago in New York, and we're really seeing the same thing um, play out in the present day. So this brings me to my overall hypothesis and framework for this talk, which is that TB epidemics in low and middle income countries are increasingly concentrated in high risk subpopulations, particularly prisons, which are a consistently high risk location. That prisons serve as reservoirs or amplifiers for TB in the general population. And that the epidemiological rationale for focusing our TB control efforts in prisons aligns with our moral obligation to tackle disparities and injustices. And so what do I mean when I talk about a reservoir or institutional amplifier? This is a framework that we put together here, just highlighting um, really the components of, of what um, uh, forms an institutional amplifier, which is that you have um, a closed institution that, is a, that contains a very high risk um, subpopulation where there's high rates of transmission and disease. You have high rates of inflow and outflow into that institution um, in contrast to a, a low risk or lower transmission um, community setting. And it's really this high rate of transmission, this movement of individuals from low to high risk, and then contacts and transmission that may occur in the community that leads prisons to amplify um, TB epidemics. And this is the hypothesis that we have, and I'm going to show you some data that support this. This concept um, was proposed about a decade ago by a colleague of mine, Sanjay Basu, um, who put this together in a modeling paper highlighting the potential for this issue, but then pointed to data in Eastern Europe and Central Asia in particular that looked at the, the rise of mass incarceration in the 1990s and the rise of drug-resistant and multi-drug-resistant TB and found there to be a strong association between these two. Um, but leaves several questions, which is, you know, is this effect causal? How do prisons drive community t TB epidemics? And most importantly, can we effectively address the, and th this and impact TB both within prisons? And if we do so, can we have a broad um, impact on community TB epidemics in the general population? So for the remainder of the talk, I'll be talking about the work that we've been doing um, in central western Brazil in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul. After this talk, you'll hear from my colleague, Julio Crota, who's really going to describe about the specific screening strategies, but I want to talk about the transmission um, within the prisons and the spillover that we're seeing there. Um, this is a state with the highest incarceration rate in all of Brazil. In the general population, there's a fairly moderate TB incidence at 35 per 100,000, but in the prisons, we're seeing 1,800 um, per 100,000 and greater. The first thing we, we really looked at in the prisons was transmission and trying to understand why there was so much TB. And what we found um, quite quickly is that the high rates of crowding and really detailed um, social networks that occur within the prisons or respiratory networks that occur are a critical driver of TB. So um, this is one of the largest prisons in which we work where each node here is an individual and each line drawn between them means that they shared a cell for at least one night. And what we found is that contrary to what people might think, that people will just, um, prisoners will just have individual cells and there will not be much mixing between them. In fact, um, prisons are highly um, intricate um, social and respiratory networks with high rates of mixing between individuals. So TB cases that occur anywhere in the prison can quickly spread throughout the prison. So this is just showing the, the, those contacts themselves. And then when we overlay where the TB cases occur, you can see that they're really spread throughout these networks. And most individuals within a year of incarcerated will be exposed to a TB case. And that's borne out by um, some prospective studies we've done, done that have shown very high rates of TB infection. So an individual that has a negative TB skin test who is incarcerated for a year has a 42% risk of being infected within a single year in this prison. We've also seen that not only is there transmission within prisons, but there's a lot of spread of the epidemic between prisons. Um, this was a single um, genotype that we tracked over the course of five years and found that it appeared in 12 different prisons throughout the state. Each line here is an individual color-coded by which prison they were in, and you see that sometimes people move between prisons. And so we were able to see the TB um, 
genotypes that appeared in one prison quickly spread um, to other prisons. And does the TB then spread beyond the prison? Is this sort of institutional amplifier loop closed? Um, so we had an opportunity to look at this by taking all of the TB cases that occur within the state of Mato Grosso del Sul and all the incarceration events, both um, people coming into the prison and being released from prison and try to merge these together and understand when is TB occurring within the prisons and outside. And when, we, when we did this, what we found was interesting, that individuals enter incarceration with really low rates of TB, no higher than that of the general population, 35, 40 per 100,000 but then face an extremely high rate of infection that occurs over the next five years and peaks about five years in, the diagnosis at least peaks five years in. And then upon release from incarceration, their rates remain high for seven years following release. So they're going back down into a low risk area, but those infections that occurred during incarceration are occurring, at then, the disease is then occurring outside the prison and this is the opportunity for transmission. And we then asked, well, is this transmission occurring? Is there the mixing occurring in the community that will allow the prisons to fully spill over into the general population? And we did this through whole genome sequencing of over 600 isolates that occurred throughout the state, including in prisons. This is a maximum likelihood phylogenetic tree and just shows the relatedness of all these isolates then color-coded by whether individuals were community members or ex-prisoners, prisoners, whether they had known contact with prisoners. And it's hard to see here, and I'm gonna zoom in on the largest um, cluster of cases we found which, um, in which there were 97 closely genetically related um, isolates that were seen. And what you can see by the colors is that many of these occur among prisoners, many of these occur among ex-prisoners, many of these occur among non-incarcerated individuals. And when we sort of look at this in more detail, half of cases that occur within the community are most closely related genetically to a case that occurred among a prisoner or ex-prisoner. So these epidemics are not occurring separately. We can't think that there's a prison epidemic, there's a community epidemic, and they're just kind of going along by themselves. They are highly interrelated. And finally, we looked at this question of whether interventions that could be performed in the prisons could have broad benefit both within the prisons and the general population. We did this through mathematical modeling where we modeled individuals as being never incarcerated, incarcerated or formerly incarcerated in these three groups and modeled TB natural history and transmission. We calibrated the model to this rich local data that we had from the state and then simulated TB control interventions in the prisons, including improved diagnostics, entry screening, exit screening, annual mass screening and IPT, isoniazid preventive therapy, and then projected the impact that these interventions could have in, in the epidemic in the prisons and the general population over the course of 10 years. What we found, unfortunately, the colors are not showing up well. The top line for each of these are prisoners. Um, the bottom line is in the, is in the broader catchment area. And I'll just make two points to kind of summarize the main findings of this that were important. The first is that we found that exit screening was actually much more beneficial than entry screening in terms of the yield of finding cases, which is not surprising given that really the TB incidence peaks late into incarceration. But this does conflict with both WHO recommendations, Brazil guidelines, and others that say we should screen people when they're coming into prison. We do not see much TB at entry. We do see a lot of TB at exit. Um, the second thing is that by doing combined interventions just in the prisons, we could have greater than 60% reduction in TB in the prisons, but we could also have greater than 30% reduction in the community TB burden. So that's really a tremendous reduction in TB incidence would get us well along our way to the SDGs just by focusing our resources in the prisons. And I think, again, this aligns with um, our obligation to tackle this important problem. So just to summarize, prisoners bear a highly disproportionate burden of TB globally. This burden may be growing. Concentrated epidemics in prisons may amplify those of general TB epidemics. And using novel um, methods to integrate genomic and conventional epidemiologic data can help us to really quantify this effect and see what the impact of interventions may be. These targeted interventions to concentrate high-risk populations like prisons, they can yield substantial gains for TB control in the broad population while also aligning with our responsibility to tackle disparities and injustices. I just want to acknowledge a huge team that was responsible for this work. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. The paper's open for questioning. Um, if anybody would like to answer some, ask some questions. Can I just, uh, just get an idea of how the prison system works in Brazil? In South Africa, we have a waiting trial 
prisoners, which I think in the States would be like jail. Yeah. There, there's a, the patients who, the, um, the prisoners who haven't been uh, sentenced, and they have the greatest mixing, yeah. and they interface That's with right. the population to a greater degree because they're going out for their trial, right. etc., yeah. moving backwards and forwards. Um, and my impression is that the long-term prisoners probably have less risk than the awaiting trial. What's the system in, uh, in Brazil, in the prisons you were looking at? I'll briefly answer and then, then put it over to Julio to see if you'd like to add to this. But there is the system of awaiting, awaiting trial, and actually there's sort of um, separate parts of the prison in which individuals who are awaiting, awaiting trial or, or triage prisons where people will go before coming into a sort of longer term incarceration facility. And yes, in those facilities, there's such a high rate of turnover that there's a lot more chance for exposures to TB, we believe. But we don't have data yet really characterizing the, the incidence or risk in those. But I, I agree with you that I think they're high risk. Brazil also has sort of a, un a unique system um, where they have an open and closed prison. A closed prison is kind of what we think of, which is you go in and you come out after your sentence. The open prison is um, you stay the night there, but during the day you're allowed to go out. Um, and it's, it's sort of almost more like a probation type thing where you're being looked after and you have to report back every night, but you're going out into the general population. And that is also a big opportunity where you're, you're in the prison, you have a high risk for TB, and then you're out in the community and, and that sort of thing. So I think there are some unique dynamics there. I don't know if Julia wants to add anything. I think the, 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 when you look at the data in the whole Brazil, the, the majority of burn is concentrating this high overcrowded prison. It's the biggest prison that has responsible for more TB cases. And the, this is the closed system. You have this open system. You have different kind of prison in the state and different rules. You have jails, have prison. It depends on the state. You have 30, 40 percent of prison don't have a, your sentence, Judith, yet. It depends. It's very heterogeneous system. Yeah, this attributable risk of uh, incarceration, we found that when we were doing cross-sectional surveys in our townships, HIV was the biggest risk factor, obviously, for TB, but the second biggest was yeah. previous incarceration. Right. Uh, so the attributable fraction is, uh, is large in other countries as well as Brazil. And let me just add on that. We found the same thing. In fact, uh, previous incarceration was the highest risk factor. It was something like a 25-fold increase in risk. And I think for this attributable fraction, I feel that we're underestimating this um, in most countries and globally when we look at the um, impact of incarceration, because we'll look at you know, what proportion of TB cases occur among prisoners, but that doesn't capture people who have been released. So actually the impact of incarceration is far greater than would be represented when we're looking at it from just at the time of incarceration. Our data show that this risk remains high for many years after, and we haven't actually captured that in these kind of attributable risk calculations. So I think it underestimates the importance of prisons in driving TB. Thanks. We've got a question from microphone four. Hi, I'm Emily Keen. I work at Harvard Law School's Human Rights Program. And kind of considering the continual growth in incarcerated populations, considering how rights abusive conditions such as extreme overcrowding also contribute to incidents, I'm wondering if you've done any modeling or have any thoughts about like measuring the efficacy of interventions that improve rights conditions for TB outcomes? Yeah, thank you for that. That's a terrific question. Um, we've, we've partially done this, and I think we could do, do more and would really welcome suggestions for how to do so. We've looked at one, um, decrowding, um, what, what the impact of decrowding would be or reducing incarceration on the TB epidemic. And as you might expect, that would be the most powerful intervention we could possibly do, more so than putting in more gene expert machines and things like that. Now, we need to do both. Um, but in terms of the gains that we see in models, um, decrowding is really important. Um, I haven't presented the data here, but we've looked at um, crowding itself within cells as well as ventilation rates um, within cells and improving, improving ventilation um, uh, in conditions within the cells, again, has much greater impact than these biomedical interventions that are on the table. Um, so all those really need to be um, considered as sort of a comprehensive approach to this problem. A question from microphone two. Yeah. Um, the... the um, that there is the, the, the high-level meeting on tuberculosis in September, and there is a constant fight about the declaration that it's going on now. I just wonder, um, and I'm advocating for uh, having uh, the prison issue in the de declaration, and it's almost not covered at all. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder what you think about that. And then you mentioned in your presentation that um, 
uh, your findings testing upon release are to not go in, in line with WHO guidelines. So what are your strategies to change that? Those are, those are great questions. I'm, you ask what I think, and I think you could probably guess what I think, that it is, it is extremely important. And, um, you know, there's just an abundant amount of data. I've shown some of it here, but there have been, uh, there's consistent findings everywhere in the world that if you want to find the highest risk population within a country, you go to a prison. And that is borne out almost everywhere. This is where the concentration of TB is occurring. You know, it's a human rights crisis, it's a public health crisis, and um, to ignore it would be at our peril and, and counter to our goals with the TB epidemic. Um, in terms of um, specific strategies for, for interventions, we're trying to put together an evidence base, and uh, Dr. Crota is going to present on the screening strategies that we're looking at. Um, I don't think it is a, you know, either or, either we do entry screening or we do exit screening. Our best effects are seen when we do multiple interventions. And um, it's clear that um, the more we do, the greater impact that we're going to have, and it would still be sensible to do it than when you have this great of a burden and concentration of TB in prisons. Thank you. We'll take uh, another question from microphone four again. If you just let us know who you are and your affiliation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gift Moerani from South Africa. I, I'm interested to hear a little bit more on the drug resistance. Uh, I think it's much interesting to find out how many of the dry list, as uh, one of the panelists raised that in South Africa we have a number of people on try whether you you find drug uh, you can find a drug assist, a resistance among, in that group or in the group that is serving long term sentences and and then what are the the repercussions for that yeah yeah thank you for that um, and my last question yeah. would be for those who are released hmm. when when they are released is there any means to mitigate uh, transmission in their families and communities. Yeah. Thank you. So the first question was about drug resistance, and clearly there is so much data showing that prisons are key drivers of drug resistance. We had um, a lot of um, data on that from Eastern Europe and Russia, where there are really high rates of MDR-TB in prisons and some evidence of spillover into the general population, but the prisoners themselves are at extremely high rate risk of TB, MDR-TB. Um, in Brazil, in the sites where we've been performing our studies, we've seen very little drug-resistant TB, less than 1%, and we're, we're kind of surprised by that, to, um, to be honest, but, but um, glad to see so little MDR-TB, of course, because it's so important to outcomes. Um, so I think that um, Brazil has an opportunity to get ahead of the game and try to solve the problem of TB in the prisons before drug resistance hits, because clearly that's going to make it so much more challenging. Um, but for the rest of the world, um, clearly MDR-TB is an extreme problem in, in many prison systems. Um, and your, your second question um, uh, was about transmission into communities and what kind of measures there are taken when somebody is released from prison. Um, essentially not, there aren't. Um, there aren't, at least in our prison system, um, really precautions for, for spreading within the general population. And I suspect that's true in many countries in the world. And the data suggests that we need to do something, whether it's um, having sort of transitional care programs where we try to you know, follow up incarcerated individuals and make sure that we're providing health services, screen for TB, provide isolated preventive therapy. Um, and, and some of the data and modeling we're doing is kind of showing that that's important, but we need real world experience to show that that can be um, an effective strategy. And we don't have that to date. Thank you. Well, time is getting short, but last question, if you can, at microphone two. I was just interested to hear more if IPT has ever been used in, for prisoners and how effective can that be? Just also considering that perhaps in future we can have the prisons brought differently, allow more ventilation and things like that. Yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of experience with um, IPT. It is not widely used in the prisons. Um, it should be used for individuals who are recently infected and we see this high force of infection. I think it's a bit challenging because there is this sustained transmission and sustained risk. So if somebody takes IPT and they stop, they're going to get reinfected and still have this risk. So I think any IPT strategy would probably have to be long term. Um, we've had some interest in sort of broad community or prison wide um, IPT to see if we can prevent infections and don't have any 
um, kind of promising results to, to show in that regard at this point. I think whatever IPT strategy is enacted in prisons, and certainly it's a tool that we need to think about, um, we're going to have to think about it differently than we might in a general population just because of this extremely high risk of infection, but also um, this high turnover rate. You know, the average duration of incarceration in our population is about a year. And so people come in for a short period of time, and then they go out. And if we wait to observe them get infected, it might be too late. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. So I'd like to hand over to my co-chair, Sabine. Thank you very much, Robin, and also Jason. Um, we will continue the session. Um, Masood Dara is going to take over. Masood is the coordinator for communicable diseases at the WHO Regional Office Europe. By training, he's a medical doctor, um, and he's specialized in public health and infectious diseases. He's also the co-chair of the working group TB in Prisons of the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease. He will be um, telling us about knowledge gaps for formulating TB control policies for prisons. Masood, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, co-chairs, and also I'd like to um, commend you for organizing this important event, talking about the prison. Um, in the framework of the AIDS, conf AIDS uh, conference that we have. Um, as I was not sure that all of us are TB people, I thought this maybe let's start, we have, we have a quick um, overview of the, what is NTB strategy, vision, goals, and targets, and principles that we have. As you know, the vision is to have zero TB deaths, uh, zero disease, and zero suffering from tuberculosis, basically a world free of tuberculosis, that's the vision that we have. And in terms of the goals, we have the goal to end the global TB epidemic by 2035. And that's the difference with the HIV that we have, uh, which is 2030, in line with the sustainable development goals. We have three uh, main uh, areas that we are looking at uh, regarding uh, TB deaths, reduction of the TB deaths, reduction of the TB incidence, as well as also catastrophic uh, costs that our people or families are going to incur. And from 2020, we have 35, your 20% uh, percent, uh, respectively. You may say why we don't have 1990 here. Um, that's one of the reasons that TB community is not that much uh, ambitious as, as the HIV community, and we have to learn a lot from the HIV AIDS. 2025, 75%, 50%, and 2030, which is sustainable development goals, 90% decrease of the TB deaths and 80% of the incidence. And 2035, which is called, uh, by definition, 95% decrease of deaths and 90% incidence, and that is called the end of a TB. There are three pillars of the NTB strategy, as you're aware. Um, it is the first one, making sure integrated care is their people-centered care. The second one is more bold policies, health system, supportive systems, psychosocial support for people, and last but not least, research and innovation. Very important for tuberculosis because research and innovation has been very, very uh, slow, and that's the reason it brought to that level. Now, what's going on in TB notification in prison? Um, these are the data that we have um, from a European region. We are collecting uh, surveillance data from countries to also just to let you know that we have 53 countries in the European region uh, with 950 million population. A very wide uh, variety in terms of um, income, from very rich countries like Luxembourg to um, some of the countries in Central Asia with less resources. Also in terms of tuberculosis, very wide uh, variety from less than one in Monaco, for example, to some countries of 140 per 100,000. Looking at the prison, about 16% of, uh, of the six percent of our uh, people who are TB having um, uh, prisoner, basically one out of 16. In terms of the notification, 26 times higher we have, uh, which is, as you know, 32 per 100,000. The notification of tuberculosis in our region is not as high as some other countries, but as you know, we have high, in term, high, uh, high rates of drug-resistant tuberculosis. Um, but also, as you know, in terms of the uh, how many times more uh, tuberculosis you have than uh, the civilian population, you see the different uh, rates from 8 to 64 times differently. And also, as was mentioned by previous speaker and some of the colleagues who intervened, drug resistance is a problem, as well as co HIV co-infection. The main challenge that also we have for tuberculosis is follow-up of released prisoners. And uh, people who are in treatment and when they come out of the prison often has a very huge problem in terms of making sure that they have continuing their treatment. And also some of these new tools like new medicines or diagnostics, um, rapid diagnosis are not readily available in a prison because often there are those services that get it last. Uh, 
We also look at the treatment outcome, and that's very important because, um, uh, if I'm correct, here, the only region we are collecting knows the treatment outcome um, uh, um, based on whether these are people of, are from prison sector or from civilian sector. As you can see, there's a huge difference of, uh, from 60% in prison to 78% in the civilian population. So, and if you may ask yourself, what are the differences? Um, so why, what are the main reasons we have lower success uh, in prison for the same type of patient? Uh, and these are not the drug resistant TB patients. Of course, it's come with a higher failure, but also more important, loss to follow up that I already mentioned in my, 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 my previous presentation uh, slide. Very important, we are the key challenges that you need to look at it. Often there's limited laboratory capacity. Prisons are not by deficient um, medical services. So they, they rely on the civil uh, sector. They send the diagnostic samples. Some of them, they have also laboratory services, but limited. Uh, very important also in terms of diagnostic capacity or x-ray. They do not have often the, service, uh, the, the equipment they need or the specialists to read all those results. Treatment is often a problem, as a poor supply of medicines. Very often we have the Ministry of Justice or Ministry of Interior responsible for health in prison, and it's not always working well because the Ministry of Health, they have their own resources, and Ministry of Justice, they have also other priorities or interior. And also the, the prisoner's per, uh, per perspective. Not all the prisoners want to be cured. And that's, you may, you may have heard about this, but it's reality. You t I've been talking to some of also prisoners in, in, in former Soviet Union. There's so drastic um, situation in some of the prisons that if they get TB, they have a better place because they have almost like a hospital, they get their care. And uh, so they are not much interested. Actually, some people also, they buy sputum from others to make sure that you know, they, they, they are diagnosed as tuberculosis. There's also hierarchy in prison, and so if you're going to be cured, you should make sure you have someone who's uh, more senior than you give permission to you. Turn over the prisoners. Prisoners are moved from one prison to another, um, and then also make it more complicated in terms of uh, treatment. And also mention in terms of continuum of care and drug resistance, HIV, and resources, and also the um, limited collaboration of NGOs. They often do not have access to prison for the obvious reasons. Um, with the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, um, there's a working group on TB in prison, and that's called for you. If you're not a member of it, please come and join. We developed a, a statement that is a time to act and prevent uh, uh, and, and control TB in prisons, and we came with 12 main areas that needs to be addressed. And um, uh, several colleagues who are attending this meeting are part of this uh, group. So what are, in summary, what are the key gaps that we have? First is that where people get the tuberculosis, and you know, Jason mentioned in his presentation, very nice data. We also heard from other uh, speakers. When people are coming to prison, they're not often checked whether they have um, the uh, active TB or not. Moreover, you also don't know whether they have latent TB or not. Uh, so having been latent TB, maybe already have infected people before being in prison. And once they come to prison, they developed it, uh, tuberculosis. We've been discussing this mathematical modeling, and, and we also came with the suggestion of let's get, for example, a, a three months time that uh, takes for the real tuberculosis happening starting from that time, if the latent TB infection testing is there. So what is the best mechanism of continuum of care? That's another thing that we have a gap. So is it supposed to be a phone call from prison to the Ministry of Health that this prison is released? Is it um, um, psychosocial support to that prisoner to, if you go on first time, refer to the healthcare services in your village or town, you would be um, uh, getting the, uh, that psychosocial support? So what would be the mechanism to have that? We, don't, we do not know what is the best. Of course, depends on the setting. And which is screening method and how often to, to use? Uh, entry screening is important for the obvious reason that you, you do not want people with TB coming to prison and infect others, but also how regularly you want to screen. People are staying for years in prison. You want to do it every six months, every once per year. Is it symptomatic screening? Is it X-ray screening? You use other methodology. These are the things that we need to you know, have more knowledge and, and research on that one. How to improve adherence, looking also at anthropological issues, some of them I mentioned, but also what are the other comorbidities uh, that you need to consider, HIV, diabetes, um, and also uh, mental uh, problems. And how we can have a better outcome in the prison and have a better impact in prison and beyond. Good TB uh, control in prison can also ha help the national program of civil society, uh, civilian sector get a better service, uh, bigger impact. And but last, last but not least, also very important commitment. 
how you want to in, in make sure that people take TB in prison serious uh, at the country level, at the government level, and those who are responsible for budget and uh, uh, resources. Um, we developed a company of good practice. We have some hard copies. Um, it's in our office, WHO officers. But feel, please feel free to approach us if you want to get, a bit, get that copy of that one. There were several examples, including from Brazil. It's a global one. And we, we actually asked different countries to, to send us, submit us good examples that they have. We evaluated whether they're sustainable, they have impact, and we, we published this one, which is going to be a, a useful resource, I hope, for other countries. A couple of words about our WHO collaborating center. You know, um, if you have an institute that is really active and providing you know, good support to, to at the global or regional level, they can apply to become collaborating center. And we establish a collaborating center. It's the only collaborating center on TB in prison. It's in Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, which was recently Dr. Tedros visited that, that center. And uh, they started in 1995 to implement WHO recommendation. From 1995, so far from the dots, then was a time that some of us were working for the Soviet Union. This was a taboo. You talk about dots or WHO recommendation, that's for, not for us. We are diff have different resources, we have, we have different approach. Um, the systematic TB case funding, they, they do it regularly and also they have uh, all the uh, rapid, rapid diagnostic techniques, uh, the, uh, including LPA, line propase, molecular techniques, but also new medicines they have. And since 2014, established as a collaborating center. Many people have been trained there. And you're more than welcome also to approach them or us to help you to visit the this, this center. It's really worth uh, visiting how they are doing. Now, in terms of results, um, that actually uh, pictures uh, speak of thousands of words, basically. You can see that both notification has been decreased as well as mortality. Very impressive decrease of mortality, almost like a zero uh, death to, to, to be. So that's a very good one, but also you can see increase of uh, treatment outcome, both for the, uh, those who are on first-line treatment as well as those who are on the uh, second line, basically MDRTB. 77% of the MDRT patients getting cured. That's a very good thing. And 95% of people with the uh, uh, drugs susceptible are cured. A couple of words, um, a gentleman from Germany, if I'm mistake, mistaken, he was mentioning about the importance of UN General Assembly. Yes, that's a golden opportunity that we have this year, 26th of September, is the first um, UN General Assembly high-level meeting. What is the difference of that one? Uh, is that you have the heads of a state coming. So heads of a state also have, uh, they have Minister of Justice and prison under uh, under hierarchy. And so that could be a good, very important uh, way to bring prison up. Um, can you see with the hands how many of you have seen the draft declaration, uh, political declaration of tuberculosis? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so that's actually the challenge that we have. So we need to get this draft political declaration to look at it. How you can do this? This is not WHO meeting. This is a UN um, uh, General Assembly meeting. Each of the countries, they have the permanent representative in New York. So that's one angle that you can approach your permanent representative, which is not often your Ministry of Health. So if you go to Ministry of Health, maybe they're not fully uh, the right people to, to, uh, to get you that. That's your Minister of Foreign Affairs or your President Office. But also civil society have a, have a say. There was a hearing that we had, and uh, there were representatives of civil society in New York that we discussed what are the key issues, so they have also their own say. So let's make sure prison gets um, much higher or a stronger uh, uh, place in the, the declaration. If you look at the latest the, um, the draft declaration, there are two times mentioned prisons, but that's so um, general. It's not really concrete um, that you want to address. So thank you very much for your attention. That was a presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Masood. Very interesting presentation. We have a few minutes for questions. So I would like to ask anyone um, who has any questions, please come up to the microphone and please start with stating your name and your affiliation. Um, and if you have, if you have, um, I can put you. Give me. Yes, that's okay. uh, my name is Dr. Ruth Labode. I'm a member of parliament for the parliament of Zimbabwe. And I'm also a co-chair of the global caucus of parliamentarians against HIV. In SADAC, I'm talking about SADAC, our, my concern right now is that only one country, Lesotho, even allows condoms in the prison. We have been told the high prevalence rates of 
uh, HIV and TB in prisons. But as if we can't acknowledge that we have a problem, in, we can't put a condom in prison, I don't see how we then treat TB. Because it's, it's like you have decided you don't want to see anybody else. If somebody coughs in prison, it takes a long time for the person to get to hospitals. So for me as an advocate, what, what I'm grappling with right now is get the system to get the heads of states, even if we are going to have a side meeting in New York, is to get them to say, we have a problem in prison, People are, men are having sex with men, so the, the HIV rate is very high. That translates to a high TB infection. And it's about time we actually started dealing with these two things together. You can't separate them. And once we do that, then we go somewhere. The whole of Sadak, there's only Lesotho. And it's such, a, it's, it's such a pity, but that's what is happening. And so I think me, we should be talking about the HLM and saying, how do we deal with these two things, especially in prison? You have to deal with both of them. Let's introduce condoms in prison. Let, uh, I know people are going to tell me rights of people. If we also want to convince our government, Zimbabwe is starting a study right now. Everybody going in prison is entering this study. You'll be tested for HIV. Because we want to prove a point that for sure some people were infected inside there. So we need to introduce condoms. And we need to introduce gene expert machines. Even those before they enter, they must be tested for TB also. So then we, we reduce the amount, because there's a lot of congestion in prison. Don't allow somebody who is, who is positive or who is sick with TB into the prison and then start treating them. No, treat them, treat them before they go in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Fully agree, and, and actually I visited many prisons, and they, they also often, you know, they, they're not health, uh, health staff. And then some of them are saying, oh, if you put a the condom there, that means that we're acknowledging that they, you're promoting. So that's not the case. There are already people are having, having men having sex with men. Then you need to give them the possibility. But one interesting example of a country, I don't name them, that I visited, um, they have been very restricted in terms of you no know, religion and you know, not you know, having men having sex. It's not acceptable and all this thing. But I went to that prison, I saw that they have condoms. And, and I thought, how you do that one? How is it possible? They said, look, uh, we know that it's happening, so uh, we also know that it's very good for prevention. So we find a pragmatic way. So we just, we have a, a room for the families to visit. So we just put the condoms there and we let the door open. So, I mean, that's of course, uh, that's not the way to, to do it. You need to acknowledge that there is a need for condom and make sure that they, they provide condoms there. But also pragmatic approach also can work in the short term while you're thinking about longer term solution. But Gene Xer, I fully agree with you. Uh, there's very important rapid tests. In 90 minutes, you know that there's a TB and also whether the pump is in resistance. So we need to have Gene Expert there, particularly drug resistance is much higher there. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, David Braden with results. Um, just on the, uh, yeah, so I'm based in the US. I'm a uh, policy advocate on, on TB. That's what I, I do, yeah, full time. Uh, lobbying, lobbyist, essentially. On the UN high-level meeting, um, unfortunately, the text of the of the declaration is not as staged now, where it can uh, be changed um, through our, our advocacy. It's uh, gone beyond, you know, our ability to uh, affect it, and and you uh, very likely will not be able to get access to the text. Uh, but um, but as you said, the 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 section on on prisoners is yeah very much vaguer than one would like. However. I think that we need to use it to the fullest. I think it can ultimately be useful. And so the UN high-level meeting, I think the, the key thing is that we challenge political leaders who attend to actually, when they speak at the high-level meeting, to say something, to make a commitment on TB in prisons, NHIV in prisons. Uh, and, and so, in other words, to, to uh, I'll, oh, I agree that... Uh, the text is not what we would like to see, but but it but we must still use the process. And so the, other, the second point is more just about the bigger picture, which is uh, this uh, this topic we uh, and the the working group that you talked about. I'm not sure. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that there's an advocacy strategy. I think there needs to be a, uh, an advocacy strategy, um, and we should have a meeting about that, an advocacy strategy meeting, including our our parliamentarian over here. Uh, and uh, you know we should have that soon, uh, not only about the high level meeting but around other you know how do we change laws if that 's necessary? How do we inform the public 
uh, how, uh, how, do we, how do we take this, you know, not just from the scholarly discussion that we're having, but out, out into the broader uh, arena. So I, I would like to have that. Thank you. Would you like to reflect on that briefly? Well, I, I fully agree. I mean, the, the declarations are declarations, and, and um, I mean, it's good to make them the best that you can get out of them. But even if you have good declaration, it does not mean that things are going to change in the country. So you need to pursue this, and, and using that platform that to, come, to get the commitment from the whole of the government. So is, the problem is that we often go, we are medics, we go to the Ministry of Health and talk. But that we need to open the doors to other ministries, Minister of Social Welfare, and also other, um, basically, the Minister of Justice Interior, and go to address them from all the, all the angles that we can. Uh, just fully agree, I don't know whether you want to add some more from our, your side, but I just endorse what uh, previous speaker mentioned from results. Thank you. I'm afraid um, um, we are out of time. Could you please hold your question uh, until the end? Very sorry about that. Um, I would like to end. Thank you, Masood, and I'll hand over uh, to my co-chair. My last slide back. Sorry. Um, could you please? Can we please have the presentation back? Hello. Yes, yes. He's, he's, I, think, I think he's working on it. Uh, not that I want to make the same presentation again, um, but just uh, very important to acknowledge people who helped you make the presentation, and I forgot to do so, and that's my colleagues who uh, helped me make the presentation. I'd like to acknowledge them and also acknowledge my son who is here who has been helping me these, during these days. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the uh, third presentation and return back to uh, Brazil. Um, the presentation is from Julio Croda. He's an associate professor of medicine at the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sol and uh, Yale Public Health School and research specialist at the Oslado Cruz Foundation. And uh, Dr. Croda will be talking on mass screening for tuberculosis in Braz Brazil's prisons generating a scalable model for early diagnosis and prevention. Yeah, I'd like to thank Robin for the invite and, and organizing this excellent section. I think it's a good opportunity to aid the community to engage in these in this, um, aims because you need to deal with TB in the prison and you need the help of the AIDS community to do some advocacy in this field. And uh, I think Jason show a lot of data. I focus my presentation you know, one project that you perform uh, since last year and present some partial results. I present some private studies that you perform together with Jason in Brazil, opportunities for intervention. This is a good opportunity. It's a very concentrated, segregated population. In Brazil, it's 0.6 of the total population, and you can do a great job and uh, try to end TB in my country. And as you show in the previous presentation, it didn't have a, a good model for intervention in the, the prison. You, Jason performed some mathematical modeling, but in the practical, what does work? That uh, is the main results of this presentation. As Masood show, you see in the reference center, since 95, you have all the support for diagnosis TB in the prison, and uh, have a huge decrease, but still 1,000 upon 100,000. One percent of total prison populations. It's uh, impress with a lot of support, and you continue to have to be in the prison and transmit, transmission is still going on. And try to do some resume of, of my state, Mato Grosso State. It's not too high prevalent HIV infection in the prison. It's 1.6, 1, 1. it's three times the general population. But in this state in Brazil, 20% of new TB cases is from the prison. And you talk about uh, less than 0.5% of the total population of the state. 
it's, it's obvious that you can do something in the prison and DOTB in the community and in the prison. But it's difficult to the politicians and the, and the people from the health to understand this. That's why it's important to show this data and that, uh, help of the community to pressures for intervention in this high-risk population. The state have high incarcerate rates in the country too because the board of Bolivia and Paraguay, all the drug traffic pass through this region. And in the beginning, uh, course, stood in 2013 in 12 prisons, the five bigger cities in Mato Grosso do Sul state. The interest find that it sometimes is different from another state of Brazil and another country. You have a baseline of latent TB very low, 80% only. This, this means that uh, this state probably didn't have a, a, a poor community, favelas, and a low transmission rate in the community. This, I think, in the future of Brazil. You have uh, the incidence in, in Brazil now, it's 30, close to 30, per 100,000 in the general population, and you have this high risk group, and you ne need to deal with TB in this high risk group. And I, I think if you, you put some money and effort in this high risk group, you can uh, achieve the, the NTB goals. But the TST conversion at one year, it's 25% of your population. It's the same prison that stay in the same, in the same uh, prison, didn't go to the community and ensure that they take TB in the prison. Did not go to the community, high risk group, like drug user, and, uh, and have contact in the community and return infected to the prison. They infect inside the prison. And at this condition in your state, it's a perfect storm of large susceptibility population coming to a high transmission set, as I just show, show. And activity being incidence in this population, it's, it's 1,400, and it's, it's very high incidence compared to, to state incidence, it's closer in this time, it's 40%, four times more. You do this court study, and uh, in the community, the majority of uh, the transmission, you have uh, like uh, individual risk factors. You know this, HIV, it's an individual risk factor for TB in the community. But in the prison, the force of infections, it's so great to have uh, this perfect environment with uh, a lot of people in the same cells, and, uh, and uh, when one patient gets infection, like, like Jason show in the social network, it's very easy to another get infected too. It didn't, it, during the court study, you don't find um, a lot of these indi individual risk factors drive the TB transmission after one year of follow-up. This indication that it's condition and overcrowded, it's the driving the disease. And uh, it's difficult to focus in one special groups and uh, to do the TB in the prison. When you, you have this study that Jason uh, mentioned, it's from Juliana Re Urego from Yale, and uh, she studied this uh, in three prisons of uh, the court uh, prison, and uh, the impression is, is the number of the beds per cells and individuals per cells. Like, one individual need to sleep, the another want to stay, wake up, because they didn't have beds to all the individuals to sleep. And uh, the recreation time is too low. They stay in the cells the majority of the time. This is the condition of Brazilian prison, but it's not different. Maybe it's better than Africa prison, Asian prison. This is a global problem. It's not a only Brazilian problem. And okay, let's to, to review this data. And uh, when you look at this data, you have this high force of infection in the prison, and the only improved passive diagnostic rates it insufficient to control TB in this setting. You, based on your 
mathematical model de decrease one month, like the patient with symptoms, they, if they uh, search for diagnosis and uh, decrease one month, it, it's only impacting 80% of the infection. And uh, the another find of this study, and Jason point out too, it's what is the contact? Who is the contact in the prison? And, uh, and it's still in some countries, some recommendation to find contacts in the prison, to find who stay in the same cells, in the same block, but this is based on a social, study, social network study. It's impossible to determine who's contact and, uh, in the prison. It's, it's, it's crazy for us, but still having some uh, recommendation. In Brazil, have still this recommendation, trying to find contact in the prison that sleep with the, the TB patients in the same cells, but they change a lot. And uh, that's why you need to do some kind of these studies to, to this, to find this kind of co concept and try to improve your guidelines too. Routine screening for activity B, it's not well performed or the wide. It have been the recommend, Ministry of Health recommendation WO guidelines, it's published, and, uh, but it's clear police implement gap. I think the majority of the prison don't do this. Optimal, why not doing? Because you don't have optimal screen strategy. You do that one month, or, or every year, every two times a year. What the combine of, of, of diagnostic tests you need, you, you use, what more cost effective. And you didn't have this information. And uh, this in, in the middle and low income countries, it's important, and you don't have this information. And uh, have, you have some challenges in the screen prisoners. Like you have clinical scores, but have some data published that's not effective. Use clinical score to identify the prisoners with, with high risk using the, the epidemiological and clinical data with the population to, with high risk is not effective too, like I show. And uh, the majority of the prison don't have access to diagnosis. The majority only perform smear sometimes. In Brazil, it's like the same. 7% of, of, uh, of uh, cases are smear negative and cutary positive. You miss a lot of cases in the prison. And um, the cutary is not well performed in, in the whole prison system in Brazil. This is probably occurring in other countries, in middle and low income countries. And uh, when you talk about shy sex rays, this becomes worse. You need intervention. If you, if you need to deal with TB in the prison, especially for mid and low income countries, you need more effective intervention. It's easy to talk about this in rich country when you have access to expert machines, x rays, other things. But in, you need to do not only these countries, you need, and the majority of the bur burden of TB in the prison in the low and middle countries. That is the goal of your project. And you have some data that show that uh, in modeling, mathematical modeling, that uh, probably be annual screening is more effective than, than uh, annual screening. Then, you try to sh to show a good like you need some evidence. You need to prove that some something work in this special condition, and uh, you try to show this. This is uh, a project f found by NIH, and uh, you begin. You try to mass the base screening in three prison. It's about five thousand nine hundred prisoners. It's seven five percent of the burning in my state. It's crazy. Why you not to do this before? And the approach to test our individuals independent of symptoms, independent of symptoms, is me, cuter expert, chest x-ray to our individuals with automatic reading and a repetitive screen every three to six months for 30 months. You do a massive screen. You, like, you need to prove at least one intervention. It's very expensive, this intervention. I know this. But at least you need to prove that the intervention can quickly reduce the transmission inside the prison. 
and a use automatic interpreted X-ray, you have a problem with staff in the prison in the middle low countries because they didn't have uh, doctors, didn't have a uh, uh, radiologist to read the, the X-rays, and uh, you find this approach, the CAD 4TB5, it's automatic interpretation system, we score the X-ray for TB risk, and you calibrate this with, with the first 80 expect positive patients and 20 control. This is an example of the patients that have a lesion in the upper lob, of, and uh, you they give a heat map of this, and uh, they score. This patient's 93 score, and have an expert positive too. This kind of thing that you can use the te technology to reduce the necessity of the staff. This, I think, the main problem in the, the middle and low country. Didn't have this, like, didn't have the cutery, didn't have uh, the, the, the doctors and in, uh, interpretation, x-ray, uh, radiologist to interpretation the x-ray. This is, is the training, accuracy curve. You have a good error on the curve. And establish a, a threshold score for food screen in your population. Establish 60. It's the, the sensitive dense specifics cross uh, in, this, in this score. This is your preliminary results. Uh, you, are, you already finished one, six months of screening of the entire population, and uh, you have uh, more than 5,000 prisoners that uh, allow to, to give the permission and include, was included in the study. And uh, what I want to point out, it's you have a high prevalence of current smoke. In this situation, coffee, have sputum, have fever, sometimes COPD, have, have all the time fever. It's difficult to patient to identify that TB symptoms. It's very difficult in the, the place where you have a lot of smoking patients. You, and you have a private incarceration that's going, going out and return going out. And what you can do with the jail is not one, only one time. They go to the community, they return to the jail, they go to the prison. This is a dynamic system. And 10% of your population already have TB. This makes challenge for X-rays too. It's uh, preliminary results, and uh, you found uh, a prevalence of 3.3. It's 3,300 per 100,000. It's 100, 100 high risk than general population in my state. The expert detect 160, it's 2.9%, and the Q3 expect negative and Q3 positive, it's 10 10 patients, and you begin to consultation all these patients that have a high score and symptoms. You do clinical consultation, me do perform this, and decide if you treat the patients or not based on the symptoms and the x-rays. You're not finished yet. But you can, you can show some predictive value of coffee and a WHO symptom screen symptom screen and x-ray score based on your cutoff. In patients, uh, what I want to, to point out, when you, the patient have symptoms and uh, coffee, especially coffee, and I have a score equal greater than 60, 30% of the patients has to be this. It's a good, it, it's, you can pick up a lot of patients using the have coffee only, and an uh, X-ray score greater than an equal 60. The one third of your patients is in this situation. The another thing that is, it's, you need to point out, the, independent of the coffee, if you have symptoms and score greater than 60, 15% of our patients in, in, in this group. And uh, I show here that X-ray help a lot to identify the high risk. Patients. But let you see what you're missing, because here is not sensitive and specific. The, here you want to the, the identify more TB cases possible during the max screen. And uh, I analyzed the cough for less than two weeks. It's a common criteria to, like, if you have coffee for more two weeks, maybe it's TB. In the prison is not the case. Half of the patients have less than two weeks of coffee and identify. 
uh, these patients, the X-ray less than 60 of score, it's 19, and a whole symptom screen negative, it's 14. That's a, a good message. In the prison, symptoms, uh, high risk group, and I showed this in the next slide, let you see the smoke status and previous TB. And uh, when you compare among individuals with cough and uh, abnormal sh chest X-rays, private TB, not predict TB, it's close, similar, the frequency, because you can say, oh, let's, if, if the patients have TB, maybe the X-ray is not good, but these patients have high risk to have TB again. You need to, to be screening X-ray again and, and expect. And uh, in inmates who smoke and have cough have no difference in TB risk compared with no smoke with cough. This is important message too, because like you didn't have high risk group in the prison. All the prisoners is high risk group. That's the mention that you need to keep in your mind. Uh, this find that our in inmates should be screened by TB by X-ray and symptom screen regarding of the TB and smoke history. Next steps, you continue to screen every six months for the next two years, identify cases occur between screening rounds and missing by mass screening because you have this uh, notification system in Brazil, it's obligatory to notification uh, TB patients, and try to determine the optimum screen frequency and algorithm to, uh, to enable efficacy and accurate mass screen. This is your goal of this project. But you have a new screen and prevention modality. You, you need to have better intervention than X-ray and uh, an expert. You need to think another intervention and you begin to test pull a sample sample in this like screen by cells. Why not pulling the samples by cells and uh, environment screening maybe is very helpful too. It's, you can do very quickly if you can detect in the environment and, and identify cells and blocks that have TB cases. You can go individual screenings. At, you need biomarks to identify subclinical TB or others at the risk progression because they don't have individual risk factors as a show. And maybe based on the high turn known in the prison and the community, maybe NIH or BCG vaccination for preventing infection. Like, you, you have time, the force of infection is too high, 40, in some prison, 42%. You have time to detect latent TB and try to this. It's good strategy. Maybe it's good to have vaccination give NIH. I think I finish. I would like to thank the f f NIH funding and uh, your team in Brazil. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. So um, we don't have too much time, but I'm just reflecting on what you're saying. You're telling us that a non-sputum-based diagnostic is required in order to get better control. And that really means that the normal TB control program is not functioning as it would do in a high transmission setting. And I think that's something that we need to take away from that. Thank you very much. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague. Thank you very much. Um, and now I think um, after um, these two talks, um, on oh, three talks, sorry, on research and also policy, it's time for a very different voice. Um, and I'm incredibly pleased um, that Carabo Rafube has, has agreed to speak in this, uh, in this session. Um, Carabo is a TB activist and a motivational speaker, and he's also the director of an NGO called From Prison to Pulpit. Um, Carabo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, uh, Mr. Robin Hood. I really um, feel honored and privileged to be here this afternoon. I think I was speaking at uh, room D202 on Sunday, and I started by saying um, I want to be punctual so that I can be invited again. So um, I think it worked because here I am, I'm invited again. So I'm going to try to be punctual so that I can be invited again. 
Um, um, Kara Rafube is a TB activist advocating for health and standard and human right of inmate in all correctional centers. Uh, he is an ex-inmate who contracted TB while in South African prison. I will actually categorize my story and I call it, um, I call it my setback was a set up for my great comeback. I'll categorize it in three parts. And like I said uh, at D202, that when I talk about prison, people are hiding their bags and cell phones. And I see the same thing here, <laughs> of which nothing will happen. <laughs> um, life before prison, I was born and raised in uh, Soweto, Mapeta extension, not far from uh, the house of our late icon, Dr. Mandela and uh, Desmond Tutu is about 10 minutes. The, time, the day you decide to visit, you can call me, I will take you there. Um, I, was, I was born in a dysfunctional family. Actually, my mom dumped me when I was three months old uh, because my father couldn't answer her. My father ran away from his responsibilities. But um, I, had to, I had to learn and to understand that I cannot change my past. I can only change my future. And my mother and my father, they were just the transportation to give birth to this handsome man. Because many a times we try to solve our past, but there's nothing we can do. And I appreciate that she didn't uh, abort me or kill me or put me in a railway line and yeah I grew up in that environment whereby every time when my half sisters and my stepmom sees me it was like I must be punished for my, what my dad did so it was very a difficult situation to to be had and educationally I was actually a laughing stock at school I was a laughing stock and I was I was rejected by my my peers even just because uh, I used to go to school with one t-shirt with torn apart torn apart shoes and ladies and gentlemen since I have the ability to buy shoes you can check my shoes I don't compromise, <laughs> I don't compromise when it comes to shoes <laughs> And um, sitting in the corner, um, not knowing who to talk to, being rejected, crying alone, it was very hard for me to, to, to make it. There is what we call grade seven, uh, just before you go to grade eight. And uh, grade eight is high school. And um, I'm the only one who failed grade seven. It was a pain because all my peers went to high school so I was so suicidal and just to cut the long story short um, I was adopted by a, a multi-millionaire by the name of Constance Molloy it was after the husband passed on he's, a, he's one of the tycoons in Soweto and I stayed with her and she used to do almost everything for me and um, and little did I know that she wanted me to pay her sexually for everything that she was doing for me, especially on weekend when she was under the influence of alcohol. She, she will knock at my room asking me for favors of sexuality, but I refused because I took her as my mom and things started to change at, at home. There was tension because now um, I don't want to comply with... Uh, with what she was asking me and in a process of time there are two guys who broke in and they, they 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 stole important things in the house i was not around i was in pretoria to play soccer because i used to be a good soccer player like i mentioned i think i was much better than messi <clears throat> i don't need your opinion <laughs> And uh, coming back from Pretoria, I was in this case that I don't know, and I was arrested. It was 2001, 13 July, and they said, whatever you say will be used against you. You have a right to remain silent. They took my fingerprint. I went to court on that Monday, and they gave me a, a further, they said further investigation, what we call remind to Sun City, uh, which is... Uh, 
excuse me, which is Johannesburg prison, one of the big prisons in South Africa. Sun City, in 2001, it was very terrible. I could actually uh, feel that this is a bad place. At the reception, there was there were no there was no screening, and we were we were overcrowded. I remember vividly. We were using one shower, one toilet, and um, I used to occupy a, a, a uh, it was two single bed at, at the top one, and the windows were were, were broken. And uh, I used to inhale uh, pollution and dirty things inside there. And I thought TB can only be contracted with, when you smoke. But um, I, I eventually had TB, not knowing how. I lost weight and I was very very thin. And Going to the hospital, the nurse who was in charge chased me back, saying to me, I'm pretending I want parole favors. Um, luckily, she was pregnant. She had to go to maternity leave. And a new one gave me a, a grace. I think I call her a good Samaritan. And um, she helped me to go through the treatment. But before, they gave me those two or three bottles to to give my saliva and um, to be tested and the, re the result came back that I'm, I'm, I'm t I have TB, I went through the treatment. It was an, an, it was an, an easy journey because uh, I had my fellow brothers who were going through the same thing but they were, some of them they were selling their medication. They used to crush it and smoke it and uh, they used to make business out of it. and. Uh, I thought to myself, you know what, this woman, she's, she's better than the one who's not here. She's, she's, she's committed to make sure that I'm, I'm getting help. And uh, even when she was not there, I made sure I take my medication. And we used to get special diet with vitamins. I started to gain weight. I started to, to see the process of, um, of coming back to self. And... Little did I know that when you are big in prison, you are attracting gangsterism. Uh, one day we were in the shower, as I indicated, it was one shower, one toilet. In a small space of a shower, we were about 15 prisoners trying to reach that head of the shower. Then you'll feel funny stuff behind you, touching you. And uh, later on at night, this guy who was 28, gangster, he wanted he attempted to rape me. I screamed, and to cut the long story short, um, I was told that he was HIV um, positive, and um, it was very difficult. Actually, when I talk about this, I think uh, I think I'm a miracle because I wouldn't be here today. And I'm glad that I'm still alive. And that's why my story is from uh, from prison to pulpit. And my setback is a setup for my great comeback. Ladies and gentlemen, um, and then I was cured from TB. Then I was transferred to Pretoria Prison. I wanted to, to, to get uh, empowerment and to know about this pandemic. And then luckily there was an organization from outside. They came to teach us. And then I, I became a qualified peer educator of TB. I started to teach other prisoners. And then I started to actually preach this gospel that TB is curable, even though there was not enough support from prison orders, because I think they also need to be educated about TB. And um, because I want to be invited again, uh, life after prison, uh, this is my family, this is my little boy, his name is Junior, and this is my gorgeous wife. Her name is Le Wuhan. <laughs> um, and the last born, I always wanted a boy and a girl, and it happened. This is my little beautiful girl, her name is Zoe. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a TP activist, I'm a businessman, um, I'm a motivational speaker, and I must end by saying I was useless, but now I'm useful. I was dead, but now I'm alive. 
I was nothing, but now I'm something. I was nobody, but now I'm somebody. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your day.